All right. So today we're going to be talking about beginning OOP and PHP. Uh, it looks like most of the people here have done a little bit in PHP uh, with OOP, but not a ton. And so we're hoping to learn some more. So as I said, please feel free to interrupt and ask questions at any time. So today we're going to talk about classes, objects, interfaces, inheritance, methods, properties, visibility modifiers, what static means, as well as constructors. So for the few people that haven't done OOP, you might be wondering, why do I even bother? Why is procedural not good enough Procedural that OOP solves? Uh, the first one of these is a lack of abstraction. Uh, procedural programming doesn't really give you a good way to combine concepts into one entity, I guess is a good way to put it. Uh, so there's that problem. You do have a way to, da to store data. You can make structures and things like that. But you don't combine that with the functionality that works on the data. So you have these functions that work on data, but they're not related. You don't necessarily know that this function is supposed to work on this chunk of data or that chunk of data or anything like that. So OOP solves those problems, and it does it pretty well. So the first concept is a class. Is everybody familiar with what a class is and how to write it? Chad is. Awesome. So a class is generally a blueprint, right? It's how are the objects that I'm going to build based on this blueprint going to look? You're going to define the things that you're going to store as far as state, the information about whatever it is that you want to represent. Uh, so in this case, I've got my car class here, and I've got a couple of different properties about it. I've got the number of doors it has and an engine, right? And there's obviously many more things that I could do, but those are some state parts of my class. I've also got behavior. I've got things like accelerate or decelerate. And now with object-oriented programming, the state and the behavior are tied together. So we don't have to know, well, this function belongs to, I think it's this sort of data or that sort of data. We know that if we put those all in a class that it's going to work because the class combines those methods and those properties all together. Now, I told the screen not to shut off, but it's seeming like it's going to, so. All right. So now there's an object. And a lot of people use class and object interchangeably, but they're really not. So an object is actually an instance of a class, right? So if you've got a blueprint for a house and you've got an object, the object would be your specific house. There may be a lot of other houses, especially if you live in, an, in, a, in a, uh, a neighborhood like mine where the houses all look the same. They're based on the you know, same four blueprints just flipped back and forth. Um, so that would be their classes. My house would be a, a, an object. So it has different things about it than every other instance. Uh, so we create a object by using the new keyword. So the next concept is an interface. And again, if you have any questions or want an, a, a, a more in-depth explanation, please raise your hand and let me know. So an interface is a way that we can ensure that certain objects have particular functionality. By telling an object, hey, you're implementing this particular interface, we're guaranteeing that everything that's going to use that is going to be able to have that functionality that we can rely on it, right? So if we say, hey, we've got this interface called drivable, we know we're going to be able to accelerate and decelerate and steer left and steer right. Now, how you're able to do that may differ from class to class, but we know that there's going to be these functions or these methods on that class or on that object that allow us to do those things. Any questions so far? All right. So in, in your class, you basically put your interface type, whatever, I don't know what you would call that state that you just showed us. Uh -huh. And then th this would say that within the class, these four functions have to exist. Exactly. If they don't exist, PHP is going to throw an error. It's going to say that you must implement, and then it will list out the parts of the interface that you have not implemented. So if we go and look at the next one where we implement these various things, we've got very different classes, right? We've got a Ferrari and a Yugo and a pickup truck. All of them are drivable. They're drivable in different ways, and they have different ways to do that. But they're all drivable. So if I'm using these in an object-oriented method or in an object-oriented program, I know that every single one of those, I can go and say accelerate or decelerate or steer left or steer right because it's guaranteed because they said they implemented that particular interface. So it allows us to use uh, all these different things in the same sort of way, right? 
So the next concept, and actually that leads into polymorphism, which is in the second uh, presentation, but we'll, we'll go past that unless anybody wants a little bit more on that. So the next part is properties, and properties are just data about an object, their state, right? So things like color or position or speed or things like that could all be stored as properties on an object. So in this case, we've got a car and it has color, could be whatever we want. It has a, a, a Boolean basically that would say whether or not we have leather interior and it has a window tint amount. So the methods then are the behaviors on the class, right? So there are things that we can do to change the state of the class or get information from the class. So in this case, we've got a Buick and it can have a signal that it can't turn off. So if you've ever been stuck behind one and they're continuing to signal, that's probably why. <laughs> any, any questions on this part? All right. So the next OOP concept, again, that I feel is fairly basic is called encapsulation. And all this is is data hiding. So you might be wondering why is data hiding important? Why can't I just have access to everything? Well, think of it again as a car, right? When you're able to drive your car, you don't necessarily have to know all of the workings of an internal combustion engine. You don't have to know about making sure that this spark plug fires at the right time or that the timing belt is working or that you're full of wiper fluid or whatever else. You have a particular interface, right? You have a brake pedal, you have a gas pedal, and you have a steering wheel. And using those things, you can pretty much control any kind of a car, right? So we encapsulate all of the parts that are internal to the car that you don't need to know about in order to make the car work. So our API or our, our application programmer interface is going to be something much more simple like the steering wheel, the gas pedal, and the brake pedal. So the way that we implement encapsulation then is through visibility modifiers. And there's three visibility modifiers provided in PHP and these are pretty standard across the board in uh, other programming languages as well. So the first one is public. And if you have a function or a method or a property and it has public on it, it means that it's going to be accessible from anywhere. It means anything that has access to that object at all is going to be able to call that thing or do that thing. If it's a property, they're going to be able to change it, delete it, blow it away, whatever they want to do, they can turn it into anything. The next one is protected. And actually, I think I may go, before I go there, <laughs> we'll go to the next slide. Uh, so as I said, public is available everywhere. And I mean everywhere. It doesn't matter if you're inside the class, if you're outside the class, you can use uh, that property or method. Private is a method or property that is only available within that object, right? So if I've got uh, my, my car or my whatever, in this case my house, the only thing that can call flush toilet, for instance, is going to be something that's within that house. It's not the best analogy ever, but it kind of works. We've also got protected, and protected is kind of the cross between private and, and uh, public. It's available throughout the entire inheritance tree of an object. And we'll get into inheritance here in a minute, but it's, it's available to both the class's parents and the class's children. Any questions so far? All right. The next concept is static. And static is used in quite a few different places in PHP, um, but the main one we're going to look at is just static methods. And all this is, is this is a method that you can call on the class without having to make a instance of the class. Or it's a property on a class that affects every, every class. You don't go and say, I want to make a new house and then I'm going to affect it. If you were to use this example and you had set size for your house and it was static, it means that all the houses that you made would instantly get an upgrade whenever you called this or a downgrade as the case may be because size is shared across every single object. It's actually at the class level. So it's uh, usually not something that you want to use unless you're sure that it's something that should be global or should be affecting. Yeah. So you said, let's say you make a stick house. Yep. And you And then you call this and you say size is now 2,000 feet. All six houses that you have made prior would now become 2,000 feet? Yep. Yeah, because if they're, if they're using that size variable, they're using it from the class. So you've essentially said, hey, the size of this house is completely reliant at all times on the blueprint of this house as opposed to how I decided to build it. 
So when I change the blueprint, which means, or I change the, some aspect of the blueprint like this size, instantly all of them are built based on that, as opposed to having it be uh, an instance variable, which means it's going to be different for each instance of the object. Make sense? The next concept is constructor. And we are almost through this presentation, so I hope we've got some more uh, questions before we get done here. But constructor is one of PHP's magic methods, and we will get into more of magic methods in the next one as well. But a constructor is how you're going to set up some of the values in your object. Um, typically, you don't want to do anything like actual work. You just want to set data values in your object. If you do work, then it makes testing a lot more difficult down the line. So what happens now is if I go and I say, hey, I want, you know, Fifi is a new chihuahua, PHP is going to call this construct method. We're going to pass in a yippiness factor, and that chihuahua is going to be built with a particular yippiness factor. And then it's going to go on and call the parent constructor, which in this case is going to be a dog. So all the rest of the dog things are going to get set up in there. Chad? Yep. So uh, specifically in here, this is a special variable that always refers to the instance of the object that you're in at that moment in time. So if I have a bunch of different houses, this is going to refer to each individual house on whichever one you happen to uh, be working with. In this case, in a constructor, parent just says call the parent class. We're going to finish setting up this particular instance of the object by using the parent constructor. And then did I have self back here somewhere? Yeah. On static? So here uh, we have a slightly different one. We've got static, and then there's also another one called self. And the difference here is when they're bound. Um, this gets a little bit more into the intermediate advanced stuff. But uh, if I were to say self right here, and then I were to make a new house, that it, some kind of new house that extends this, then uh, self would refer to, at that moment, that particular class. So uh, this is probably one we should come back to with an example. Um, but it, it's, it's called late static binding. And uh, the way it, it basically it's when does PHP turn the word static or the word self into the actual class. So. Um, Right here, this could actually, at this point, be replaced with house. And it would be if we're creating a house. If I created a new kind of house that extended house, then this would be replaced with whatever the other name was. If I'd use self instead, then it would always be house because it exists in this one. So we can come back to that later. Yeah? You can. In this case, this is actually a public static house because I didn't specify it, or a public static size, rather. So somebody else could come in and say the size of this house is banana, and it would not be able to say anything about it. Can you put a default on the static variable? So when you first start, it says all houses are going to be 1,000 feet, and it knows that until you override it? Yes. Yes, you can. Um, and you can put it right, right here. It doesn't have to be in a constructor level. Um, yes? What's that? Correct, yeah. Any more on static for right now? All right. Next concept is abstract classes. Abstract classes allow you to provide some functionality to an object but doesn't allow you to actually create an object of that specific type. So in this case, we've got some basic functionality that we want to provide for shape. We have a center that we know we can figure out for all kinds of shapes, so we went ahead and provided that. So we've got a get center function. Um, and we also know that each shape is going to need to provide a way to get its area. But we don't know how that's going to work. The way you calculate areas for triangles and circles is totally different. So each one of those types of shapes is going to need to implement their own way of getting an area. Um, so abstract allows us to do that. 
Uh, on the get area, you may also notice that abstract is there as well. That's another indicator that if you extend this class, you either need to mark it as abstract or you need to provide the functionality and actually define the method in the, in the child class. So what's the difference then between abstract and the ability to specify the interface? Here you're saying we all have to get better to do the same thing in the interface. They all have to have get area to do the same thing in the interface. So there's a couple of differences. Uh, the first one is, in an abstract, I can actually provide functionality. I cannot provide any functionality in an interface, and I cannot provide properties in an interface. I can only provide method signatures. So that's one difference. Now, we could go further and say, well, what if I had an abstract class that didn't provide any functionality? Every, every single method in there was marked as abstract, and we didn't provide any properties, right? So now it's essentially the same as an, app, as an interface, rather. The difference is, is that I can implement more than one interface and I can only extend a single abstract class. So that's the main difference there. So if I'm going to do something like that and not provide any functionality, I may as well do it as an interface. Because then I could extend from something else, gain some functionality there. I guess the never shut off thing is kind of short. What's that? Yeah. Let's see if I can fix this here. Oh. Yeah, there it is. Maybe I told it never something else. Come on. Okay, so that makes sense then for the difference between abstract and interface? All right. So as you saw, that's actually the last slide of this presentation. So is there any questions now for some of the beginner concepts here? Also, this talk is on joined in. If you would please take the time to rate it, I would appreciate it. Sure, yeah, so when I would want to use an abstract class is when that abstract class provides a lot of the functionality that I'm going to be needing in my class anyway. Um, and an interface is when I'm going to want to be able to provide uh, functionality that an interface defines. So abstract classes could also implement interfaces for me or mostly implement them. And if the functionality that's provided in that abstract class gets me most of the way there, then it might be a good idea to use abstract classes. So if you're if you're writing an abstract class or is it if you're you just using one? I guess I'm just trying to understand why you would use an abstract class as opposed to just a regular class and then extend that. Well, say for instance on the shape example. I have no way whatsoever of knowing how to find an area of an arbitrary shape, right? I don't know what shape it's going to be. It could be anything at all. But I know there's common functionality. And again, you know, we're limited to 10 lines or so on the slides. But you can imagine there's a lot more functionality that might be common among a bunch of different shapes. And then there's other parts that are specific to an individual shape. So if that common functionality is something that I think I can use and take advantage of, then that would be a reason to extend an abstract class. But since I can't uh, instantiate the abstract class because it doesn't make any sense without a more specific one, that's why it might be marked as abstract as opposed to just a standard like class shape. Yep. Well, the abstract class is optional to a point, right? So what Chad was saying is, let's say I just made this not an abstract class, or even if I do make it an abstract class, but I have public function get area and it's just empty, it's blank. And I'm expecting in your child class that you're going to override it and provide the specific functionality on how to get that particular shape. 
You might not. By marking it as abstract, I'm forcing you to have to provide that functionality because we may pass this into something that's just expecting shape and it's going to expect, hey, I can call get center and I can call get area and it's going to do something. But in your class, you're not going to, even if you use an interface, you're going to have to put a method to get area like the postal, and otherwise yep. the interface is going to force you to say that doesn't work. Whereas if you put this in, now you don't have to write anything for get area because it's going to pull the stuff out of the abstract class and say that get area function exists without my writing anything, correct? Only if it was blank. In this particular case, absolutely I have to write it. I have two choices in this case with the abstract class as it's written right now. I can either provide that functionality or I can make the class that I extended also extended with also be abstract. And then I can leave it till some other thing. So I could maybe make a, you know, make a, a subclass of this of, of quadrilaterals, right? But there's a whole lot of different quadrilaterals so I'm not necessarily knowing how to do the area for all of them, but I may have, you know, four sides that I'm going to keep the track, track of their length or whatever, and I know that all of them are going to have four sides, so I'm going to keep track this way. So I can add and augment some functionality, but I still don't have that get area. Well, in that case, I still can't create a quadrilateral by itself. I have to go and extend it and be a rhombus or a square or something like that. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so that's the end of this talk. Um, we'll have a few minutes to mill around, meet people. Um, for those of you that are planning on sticking around, and I hope you do, uh, I brought a bunch of prizes, including it's probably like $2,700 worth of stuff to give away tonight. Um, so hope you'll stick around for that. We have a little bit of food uh, left and a lot of beer and soda left. So help yourself, take a bathroom break, smoke break, whatever else, and we will start back up here in probably 10 or 15 minutes.